sessions. And tonight is uh, part 20 in that series. And today's presentation is called In Search of the Remnant. I mentioned yesterday when we were talking in our program that there are so many different churches in the world. And of course, God wanted the church spread across the world. Of course, there's going to be many different churches. But what I'm talking about is many different denominations across the globe. And why is that? Why is there, it says here, over 33,000 different denominations of Christianity? Was that God's intention? Was that God's plan? that there should be thousands of different denominations of Christianity with different beliefs, different organisations? Or did God, in fact, intend there to be just one? Um, and we want to know what happened in the history of the church. We also want to know, is it possible to find God's church today? Certainly, God has people in all kinds of different places across the globe, right? There are many faithful spirit-filled, heaven-bound, godly people in all sorts of different places, all right? But does God have a church on earth today? We want to have a look at that. In John 17, 21, Jesus was praying just before he went to the cross. He was praying for his disciples. And not only did he pray for the disciples that were there with him, present at that time, he prayed for those disciples who would believe thereafter as well. And he says in John 17, 21, he says, he prayed that they all may be one. As you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. So Jesus is praying that his disciples would be united, that they would all be one. And you may be aware that today there is a growing movement among many churches that said, hey, we all should be united. We all should be getting together. We should be one. And they're drawing from this passage in John 17. When Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus, he wrote a letter, and in Ephesians 4.46 he says, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. Paul here says there is one body. Now the Bible tells us that the body, body of Christ is the church. The church is the body of Christ. But Paul says there's one body. And uh, I guess if you have a body, you should have a head. And who would be the head? The Bible says Jesus is the head, right? So there's one body and one head, and that's Jesus Christ. And the Bible says one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Paul goes on in his letter to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 12, 12 and 13. He says, For as the body is one and has many members, but all that the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body. In other words, as far as God was concerned, as far as Paul was concerned, the church that Jesus was building was a united church. People were being baptized into one body, the Christian church. Of course, back then, the Christian church was a, a new thing. It was considered a sect of the Jews, but it became, of course, the Christian church. We were baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. So, number of times in the Bible, it talks about the fact that there is one body. We're called into one body. We were baptized into one body. And again, in chapter 12, verse 25, Paul says that there should be no schism in the body. In other words, that word simply means no division. God was not wanting his church to be divided and scattered and fragmented into thousands of different pieces. Why are there, in fact, so many churches? And I guess there are a lot of people who are shopping for church. They're looking for a church and they wonder, with the myriad of different varieties out there, which one should I go to? And there are a variety of reasons, I guess, why people choose to go to a church. Some people might say, well, I'm going to the church that's closest to my house. 
doesn't matter what denomination it is, doesn't matter what they believe, but I'm going to the one closest to my house. Or they might say, well, I'm going to go to the one that my grandmother went to. That's just the one I'm going to go to. Or they might say, I'm going to go to the church that has a great children's program because I've got kids and we want to go to a church with a great children's program. Do we like a church that has a great children's program? Sure, right? Or we might say, well, I want to go to the church with the best music program. Or maybe we want to go to church that puts on the best lunches. I know, I know some people who turn up to one church after another because that's the lunch day. <laughs> they go for the lunch, right? God bless them. Searching for church. Or they might go to the church because it has the best architecture. It's got the nicest building. Or maybe they go to a church because they like the preacher there. What, if anything, should be the criteria of why we go to church? And how do we choose which church to go to. Somebody said, it's a bit like choosing cereals. You go to the supermarket and there's an aisle full of breakfast cereal. Well, which one are you going to choose? Well, sometimes we choose the one with the nicest picture on the front. Or we choose the one that's got a toy in the box. Or, you know, we choose the one that's, you know, got a competition, you can win a car or whatever it might be. And then other people have a look at what the ingredients are of the cereal on the box, because they want to know what's on the inside. And that's how they choose a box of cereal. But how do we shop for church? Some people throw their arms up and say, well, I believe in God, I believe in Christ, but there's so many churches out there, it's so confusing, let's just forget it. I'll just stay home, have church at home. But the Bible actually reminds us that it's God's intention that we gather together. You know, the church is God's idea. I'll throw this in, I wasn't meant to, but I'll throw this in. Church is God's idea. Jesus says, on this rock I will build my church. It's God's idea. And then he says to his disciples, he says, by this shall all know, men know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. And so he takes this group of people and puts them all in one room that are as different from each other as chalk and cheese. So you have old people and young people, you have male people and female people, you have white people, black people, brown people and every shade in between. You have unemployed people and you have CEOs of businesses, you have a single mum and a family of four. You have all these different kinds of people all in the same room and God says, love one another. And then he says, now I want you to love your neighbour. And then he says, I want you to love your enemies. And of course, Jesus wasn't asking us to do anything that he hasn't already done himself. But one of the reasons for church, I think, is God wants us to love, learn here how to love people who aren't like us. So that we can love our neighbour who's not like us. So that we can love our enemy who's not like us. When Jesus came to earth, how many people did he find that were like him? Zero. Zero. There was nobody like Jesus when he came, but he showed us how to love people who are not like us. And that's part and parcel of church. And so God's intention is that we gather together. Hebrews 10.25, written 2,000 years ago, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, encouraging one another, and so much the more, as you see the day approaching. And when he says, as you see the day approaching, he's talking about when Jesus will return in glory. And so we are 2,000 years closer to that event now than Paul was when he wrote that in Hebrews 2,000 years ago. In other words, he's saying, if there's any time that we should gather together and stick together, it's now. Don't forsake that as you see the day approaching. So how are we going to choose? How are we going to find out when there was one church at the beginning and there are so many now? Well, in the book of Acts, we've mentioned this verse before, in Acts chapter 20, verses 28 and 30, Paul here is speaking and he says, Therefore take heed to yourself and to all the flock to shepherd the church of God. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. 
And we've read this verse before, and we've recognized that Paul is predicting here that from within the Christian church, men would arise to draw people away after themselves. And we found that this has been the case in Christian history. We're going to move on to Revelation chapter 12, where Revelation 12 is kind of a a very brief history of the church in a chapter. And it says in verse 1 and 2, Now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon at her feet, and on her head a garland of twelve stars. And being with child, she cried out in labour and in pain to give birth. This is a woman who's about to give birth to a child. And this woman represents the church of God. She is clothed with the sun, the Bible says. She's clothed with the sun. And uh, that simply represents Jesus, the son of righteousness. It represents the light of the New Testament, the New Testament church. She's standing on the moon. The moon simply reflects the light of the sun, doesn't it? Likewise, the Old Testament simply reflects the light of the glory of Christ that would come. The moon represents the Old Testament. She's clothed with the sun, which represents the new. She has a garland of 12 stars over her head, which represents the leadership of the church. The 12 apostles, if you like. And she is about to give birth, and the, she's going to give birth to a male child, and that child is Christ. The Bible tells us here that a woman is symbolic of the church. We find it in Ephesians and in many other places in the Scripture. It says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church. If you've been to a wedding, what typically does the bride wear? White. Why does the bride wear white? It's a symbol in Christian marriage. It's a symbol of the church. The Bible tells us that. Christ is the bridegroom, the church is the bride, and the woman here in Revelation 12 represents the church. Now in the book of Revelation, you have two women. You have, the book, the, you have Revelation chapter 12, where you have a pure woman who represents the pure church of God. And then you also have in Revelation 17, an unfaithful woman. In fact, the Bible doesn't mince its words, it calls... He calls this woman Babylon the mother of harlots, or the mother of prostitutes. That's not a very pleasant phrase, but that's the Bible word used to describe this unfaithful woman. This unfaithful woman represents the unfaithful church, or should I say, it's called Babylon the mother of harlots because she gives rise to many other daughters who also prove unfaithful. So you have this Babylonian system in Revelation 17 that's represented by this woman. And so you have these two women in the book of Revelation, one in Revelation 12 representing the pure church and a woman in Revelation 17 representing an unfaithful church. Why is that there? We'll find out as we move forward a little bit. In Revelation 12, 4 and 5, it says, And the dragon... We've learned who the dragon is. The Bible tells us very clearly in Revelation 12 that the dragon is that serpent of old called the devil and Satan. So the dragon, the dragon and the devil stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. She bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron and her child was caught up to God and to his throne. This child, as we've mentioned, is the Lord Jesus Christ. The devil attempted to destroy Christ as soon as he was born. Maybe you've heard the story, you know, after the Christmas story of Jesus being born in Bethlehem. Herod heard about this child and he sent soldiers to destroy the child, destroy all the baby boys two years and under from Bethlehem. But God had given Joseph in a dream a warning, take the child, flee to Egypt. And Jesus had escaped. So the devil indeed did try to destroy the child as soon as he was born. It says he will rule all nations with a rod of iron. Revelation 19 tells us that this person who rules all nations with a rod of iron is called the King of kings and the Lord of lords. It's Christ himself. And it says her child was caught up to God and his throne. And we know that after Jesus' death, burial and resurrection... 
He appeared to his disciples on a number of occasions over a period of 40 days. And then he ascended to heaven and is now at the right hand of the throne of God. So this is who that child represents. Nevertheless, the dragon did not cease his pursuance or his persecution of this woman. And in Revelation 12 verse 6 it says, Then the woman fled into the wilderness, where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her there 1,260 days. And this symbolically represents 1,260 years when the church would be in the wilderness. The genuine church of God would have to flee into the wilderness because the devil was intent on persecuting the church. And at first the devil persecuted the church externally through the pagan Roman Empire. You remember the stories of the Christians and the lions in the Colosseums. But then that was not working. The church was growing and spreading. And so the devil changed his tactic. And he says, well, if I can't destroy the church from the outside, I'm going to join the church. And the devil joined the church and attempted to destroy the church from the inside. And began to fulfill what Paul had spoken about in Acts. That from among themselves, men would rise up to draw disciples away from themselves like savage wolves. And so the, the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God. They should feed her there 1,260 days. A little later on in the chapter, it talks about when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to that child. And it goes on next verse, but the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for a time, times and a half a time from the presence of the serpent. And so here you have this period of time. It's sometimes given as 1,260 days, sometimes a time, times and a half a time. Sometimes it's given as 42 months. But it's given in the Bible as this period where there would be darkness in the church. And we've recognised that that period covers the period of papal supremacy from 538 AD to 1798 uh, AD. And the church was in the wilderness. In spite of this, God has always had many faithful people in all kinds of different persuasions. And God still had many faithful, devout followers in that system. We are talking here about a system, not a soul. We are talking about an institution, not an individual. We're talking about a power, not a person. So even within the Roman faith, there were still faithful people. But we were talking about the system that had strayed so far away from biblical practice. And so you had calls for reformation of the church of the Dark Ages. And in the 14th century, there were people like John Wycliffe. Of course, he was a Roman Catholic. Everybody was back then in Christendom. And John Wycliffe was calling for reforms within his own church. He's saying, we're not practicing according to the scripture. In the 15th century, a man by the name of John Huss, he learned from John Wycliffe. And John Huss in, uh, was a Czech reformer from Bohemia and he was calling for reforms. He ended up being burnt at the stake because he dared to raise his voice against the established church. And then we come to the 16th century and the Reformation under Martin Luther. You know, last year we just passed the 500th anniversary of the beginnings of the Reformation under Martin Luther. And what I like about the Lutheran church is Martin Luther emphasised the Bible and the Bible only as the rule of faith and practice for the Christian. Because Martin Luther, as a doctor of the church, had access to the scriptures. And he was able to read. The common person didn't have access to the scriptures. In fact, common people were forbidden by the church to read the scriptures. You find that hard to believe when you've got thousands of Bible on your phone now. Hard to believe that it was illegal to read the Bible. 
But Martin Luther, being a doctor of the church, he had opportunity to read the Bible, so he would read. And he was saying, we are not practicing the Christian faith according to the Bible. And so one of Martin Luther's chief teachings was the Bible and the Bible alone. And that's what I like about the Lutheran church. I also like the fact that he emphasized salvation by grace through faith alone. Those were the teachings, some of the teachings of Martin Luther and that caused him to become excommunicated from the church. Martin Luther never wanted to leave his church. Martin Luther was a Roman Catholic. He wanted to reform his church. But his reforms or his calls for reform led them to excommunicate him, to cast him out of the Roman church. And of course, the Lutheran church was formed after the teachings of Martin Luther. Another man came along later in the 16th century, Calvin, John Calvin. He was responsible for the Reformed and the Presbyterian churches. A man, a student of his, John Knox, formed the Presbyterian Church in Scotland. And what I like about the Presbyterian Church is they believe in the sovereignty of God, that God is in control of the universe. They, found, they rediscovered these truths in the Bible and they trumpeted them. And they believe in the security and assurance of salvation in Christ. We should have assurance in our knowledge that Christ has died for us and has saved us and we have accepted him. A little bit later on, we come to the time of John Smith. He was an Anglican minister. He left England for Holland in 1607. He was baptised by immersion in 1608. And the first congregation of Baptists was formed in 1612. They discovered that baptism in the Bible was by immersion. And they said, this is biblical, this is what we should practice. And what I like about the Baptist church is they rediscovered that baptism was by immersion. You can see here as gradually various reformers discovered something, rediscovered something in the Bible. It was new to them, but it wasn't new. It had been there for 2,000 years. It wasn't new, it was as old as the Bible. But they'd rediscovered it. And they said, hey, this is biblical, we should practice this. And each of these reformers and each of the churches that followed them had discovered that little piece of biblical truth. Another man came along in the 18th century, John Wesley in England. He was, an, again, he was an Anglican minister. But he wanted reforms in his church and eventually people after John Wesley, they formed the Methodist Church after the teachings of John Wesley. And what I like about the Methodist Church is they teach living like Christ, his life in us. They teach biblical sanctification, that Christians aren't simply forgiven, they're transformed. We are changed. The Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Behold, all, all things have passed away, all things become new. We're transformed by the gospel. We don't simply live the same old lives. And he taught that because it was biblical and he rediscovered that. Truth was slowly being restored. Different people were finding new truths in the scripture. Each new group built, they built on the rediscoveries of previous groups. And light was gradually dawning on the Christian church. We come to the end of that period of 1,260 years and when General Berthier entered Rome and arrested the Pope, took him prisoner. The Pope died in prison. That marked the end of an era and Christians in Europe and Christians in the New World in America recognised this as a fulfilment of prophecy and they began studying the Bible. After 1798, Scholars, priests, ministers and lay people of all denominations, Roman Catholic, Anglican, Methodist, Congregationist, Baptist, Presbyterian and many others, they began studying the books of Revelation and Daniel like they never had before. You can actually see uh, documents where the number of books published on Daniel and the Revelation before 1798 is minuscule. The number of books published on Daniel and the Revelation after 1798, it's like an explosion. 
because Christians, different denominations, began saying, hey, this prophecy is being fulfilled. What else do these prophecies teach? They began serious study of the, the longest prophecy in the Bible, Daniel 8, 14, and to 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. What did that mean? It was part of the book of Daniel, but it was a, a sealed part of the book of Daniel. And it says, seal up the book until the time of the end. And they recognised that at 1798, they had entered a period known as the time of the end. Many different denominations studied this passage for 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. And they believed something was going to happen in 1843, 1844, because that's when they believed that 2,300 year prophecy came to an end. They, they looked at Daniel chapter 8. They looked at Daniel chapter 9. They discovered the beginning point of that prophecy. And they understood that in 1843, 1844, something was going to happen. The cleansing of the sanctuary would happen. There was a Baptist farmer. His name was William Miller. Now, I'm not a Baptist. I've never been a Baptist. But I like William Miller. And he began studying this passage. And in fact... He studied this passage and others around it for 13 years. How are your Bible studies habits? How are your Bible study habits? He had a lot of patience, I think. But he studied this passage for 13 years and he became impressed that the world should know that something's going to happen in the mid-1840s. But he wasn't a preacher, he was a farmer. And he was very intimidated about talking to a group of people. I mean, look at you. You can understand why. It's very intimidating up here. But he was intimidated by that and he, he didn't want to speak. But he prayed to God because the burden was on his heart. You've discovered this. You need to share this with the world. And he was so burdened down with it, he just prayed. He said, Lord... If you want me to share this, have somebody invite me to preach. That's never going to happen. And after he prayed that prayer, a knock came on the door. Farmer Miller, will you come and preach this weekend at our church about what you've been reading? And he cursed himself for making that promise that he would do it. But he eventually gave in and he chose to share that message. And he began to share what he believed, which was that Jesus was going to come back in the mid-1840s. That's what he believed, because he thought the cleansing of the sanctuary, that must be the cleansing of the earth by fire. So he began sharing that. And other people cottoned on to that. And many people, Baptists, Methodists, Presbyterians, Congregationists, Anglicans, etc., it was an interdenominational group. They began to preach that Jesus was going to return and eventually they settled on a date. Jesus is going to return on October the 22nd, 1844. But October the 22nd, 1844 came and went and Jesus did not return. Many abandoned their faith. Others took off on tangents and began date setting, setting other dates for the coming of Christ. But others said, we need to go back to the Bible. What did we do wrong? Where did we go wrong? And they examined the information and they recognised, sure enough, the 2,300 days does indeed reach to 1844. Can't argue that. But what is this cleansing of the sanctuary? And they studied the Bible and they realised that there is a sanctuary in heaven of which there is a high priest and his name is Jesus. And they recognised that Jesus began another ministry of cleansing the sanctuary in 1844. This was an interdenominational group. People from all different stripes and types studying the Bible. They studied the Bible they embraced those truths that other godly people had discovered, Luther, Calvin, Wesley and others. They discovered other Bible truths and they eventually became 
the Seventh-day Adventist church. Now, what I like about the Seventh-day Adventists is they believe in the visible return of Jesus. You know, in the Bible, in the New Testament, it's a core teaching of the New Testament is the glorious return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that had been lost sight of because most people believe that when you die, you went straight to heaven. So why do we need the second coming? But they discovered that in the Bible, when you die, you go not to heaven, not to hell, but to sleep until the resurrection at the coming of Christ. And suddenly, if the, if the dead were in their graves asleep, suddenly the second coming takes on new meaning. Because without it, there's no hope. It's the second coming where the saints rise from the dead. And so they believed in the visible return of Jesus. They believed that judgment has come. The Bible says the hour of his judgment has come. And that message is given before Jesus returns. They understood that death is asleep. They learned that they had a global mission, not just to the Christian nations, but to all nations. And they recognised that there were three messages that needed to go to all the world before the end come. And that's in Revelation 14, verses 6 to 12, the three angels' messages. Notice what these messages say. First one says, Then I saw, and by the way, the reason these were so vital to them, they believed that Jesus was coming back soon. They still believed that. But they recognised that Jesus comes back in Revelation 14, 14. And these three angels' messages are given just before Jesus returns. So they recognised these were the messages that God was asking them to share with the world, and they're in the Bible. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. And worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. They recognised that there was a calling in this message back to, to belief in God as creator. And they recognised that there was a call here to return to keeping the Sabbath. Because that's a symbol, a memorial of God's creation. They read the second angel's message in verse 8. And another angel followed saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. That's a mouthful. But basically there was this fallen system of religion that was making the world drunk with its teachings, was confusing people. Babylon ultimately means spiritual confusion. God is trying to give us clear truth through his word. And they read the third angel's message. A third angel followed them saying with a loud voice, not a whisper, but a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast in his image and receives his mark in his forehead and on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God. And they said, well, we better find out who the beast is and what the image is and what the mark is. If the most severe warning in all the scriptures is given here against those who worship the beast in his image and receive his mark, we better find out what those things mean. We've discussed that and we discovered that in our previous messages. And then finally, the third angel's message finishes like this. It says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. You know, there are many people in the world who keep the commandments of God but don't have faith in Jesus. Did you know that? They're called the Jewish people. The Jewish people keep the commandments, don't they? I mean, they're written in the Old Testament, the law of, you know, the Ten Commandments given to Moses on tablets of stone. The Jews keep the Ten Commandments, but they've missed the jewel that is Jesus. There are many in the world who believe in Jesus, aren't there? They call them Christians, followers of Christ. But not all Christians keep the Ten Commandments. Because they've missed out one. And it says, remember. God is calling his people at the end of time to keep his commandments and to have the faith of Jesus. 
And uh, they recognize themselves in this passage, Revelation chapter 12, 12, verse 17. This is from the King James Version. It says, And the dragon was wroth or angry with the woman. So the devil is angry with the woman, the church, and went to make war with the remnant. Here's that word remnant, the remainder, that which is still remaining. Went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. The commandments and Jesus. That's what they recognised. Here in this passage it says the testimony of Jesus. The Bible tells us in Revelation 19.10 that that is the spirit of prophecy. Well, here's six identifying characteristics of God's end time remnant church from a biblical perspective. Number one, it says they keep God's commandments. And if that means all of them, it includes the fourth commandment, that really narrows the field, right? I mean, if you're going to look for a church that keeps all the commandments, including the Sabbath, that's narrowing the field dramatically. Now, we've said before, God has his people everywhere, but we're looking for God's remnant church. They have the faith of Jesus, so it's got to be a Christian organisation. It's got to be a Christian church. They have the faith of Jesus. They proclaim the three angels' messages because that's the message that those who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus are sharing. It is a global movement. can't be in a corner somewhere. You might have a congregational church that just serves that community and nowhere else. Well, that's not the commission that God gave us. It's not the commission Jesus gave. Go into all the world and make disciples. It's a global mission. It emerges... After that dark period, it emerges after 1798. That narrows the field. And it has the gift of prophecy. When I look at these six characteristics of God's remnant church given in the Bible, the only one I know of that meets those characteristics is the Seventh-day Adventist church. Now at this point I need to say something. I was not born a Seventh-day Adventist. I was not raised a Seventh-day Adventist. I did not go to a Seventh-day Adventist school. I came from a secular atheist background. But after my encounter with God, I didn't even know anybody who was a Seventh-day Adventist. I'd never even heard the name. What a strange name, right? Just in bla- you know, it just eclipses those two messages of the seventh day and the Adventist, that's the advent, the coming of Christ. But I thought, what a weird name when I first heard it. God sent, I was working in a cocktail bar, God sent me somebody who had been raised Adventist, but had drifted out, sent me somebody to talk to me about God in a cocktail bar. And I was a skeptic because I didn't believe in God, right? But then God entered my life, God revealed himself to me, and I began to say, well, let's take this book a little bit more seriously. And all I know is I went from being an atheist to becoming a Seventh-day Adventist. And when I study the Bible, friends, I don't have a choice. If I want to be a Bible-believing Christian today, if I want to be someone looking for that remnant church, I don't have a choice. I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. And if this isn't the remnant church, please point me in the right direction because I'm out of here. I'm not staying because I like the food. I'm not staying because I like the people. I love you, really. I'm here because it's biblical. And many others have found that too. USA Today had a story in 2011. Adventists back to basics faith is fastest growing US church, it says. The Bible tells us in the book of Revelation, we talked about it last night, chapter 13 It says all the world is going to wonder after the beast except those who are found written in the Lamb's book of life. You've got two groups. One is going to be all the world. That's a lot. And then there's this little group. It's called the remnant. They're going to stick with Jesus and keep his commandments. The world today is calling people of all faiths, doesn't even mean Christian, they're wanting, we should unite Unity is a good thing. Pope Benedict XVI, when he came to become Pope, 
It says, Benedict prays for church unity. In his message, the Pope appealed to the Christian church, for the, for the unity, rather, of the Christian church. He's saying, there should be one flock, one shepherd. Who do you think he thinks that shepherd should be? Pretty, pretty obvious. You see, they understand this issue sometimes better than we do. Notice what they say here. In a book called The, the, the Bible and Authority Only in Catholic Hands. Notice what they say. Catholic, is the Bible the rule or guide of Protestants for observing Sunday? Protestant, no. I believe the Seventh-day Adventists are the only ones who know the Bible in the matter of Sabbath observance. That's their statement. Here's another one. 1942, the Catholic Universe Bulletin. The church changed the, the observance of Sabbath to Sunday by right of her divine infallible authority given her by her founder, Jesus Christ. The Protestant, claiming the Bible to be the only guide of faith, has no warrant for observing Sunday. In this matter, Seventh-day Adventist is the only consistent Protestant. You see, the Protestant ma mantra is the Bible and the Bible only. And the church knows that if you're going to go with the Bible and the Bible only, you're going to keep the Sabbath. Rome's challenge. This was reprinted in a Roman Catholic website in 2003. And this was you know, given a, a long, long time ago. But it says, the challenge issued by Rome over 100 years ago remains. Either the Catholic Church is right or the Seventh-day Adventists are right. There can be no other choice. And if one chooses neither, then the whole doctrine of sola scriptura collapses. And with it, the pillar upon which all Protestantism stands. They understand. One last one. St. Catherine Catholic Church Sentinel, 1995. People who think the scriptures should be the sole authority should logically become Seventh-day Adventists and keep Saturday holy. That's what they say. Right? I mean, they're telling it like it is. There was somebody else who said there should be one flock and one shepherd. That was the Lord Jesus Christ. John 10, verse 16, he says, And other sheep I have which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. At the end of time, there's going to be one flock and one shepherd. And I know which shepherd I want to follow. It's either the true shepherd or the false shepherd. It's either going to be Christ or it's going to be the one in the place of Christ, anti-Christ. You might be saying, well, but I thought that God's remnant church is going to be made up of people from all different you know, churches. It is! They even accept atheists like me. The Seventh-day Adventist church was born, it's a movement, I believe, it's a movement born of God. I find it in the scriptures. I'm as convinced of this movement as I am about the Israelites in the Old Testament. That God raised up this movement to bring us back to the truths of God, God's word. You know, if you belong to this movement, that should not make you arrogant. It should make you humble. That God has chosen to use you to share a message with the world. That's why God raised up this movement. I don't know who you are today. I don't know where you've come from. I don't know what your background is. We've been covering much material in our series, Is God For Real? And God is calling us today. He's calling us to himself. Jesus is calling us as the true shepherd. He says there's going to be one flock and one shepherd. Don't you want to follow the true shepherd today? Don't you want to become part of his flock? If you do, commit your life to Christ today and follow him wherever he goes.